In this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying, Bill Cox will give you a left seat checkout in Piper's High Flying Cabin Class Malibu. You'll visit a high altitude mountain airport with Barry Schiff to compare book figures with actual performance in three different types of airplanes. You'll get to fly in one of the few remaining B-17s, and you'll meet some of the courageous men who flew them in World War II. And finally, you'll see what it's like to fly the hot new Lance Air, one of today's best-selling home builds. All this and more. This is the wonderful world of flying. It's called the Piper Malibu, and it's the best-selling single-engine piston airplane in the world. Surprisingly, it's also the most expensive single available. In 1986, in the middle of the worst recession in general aviation history, Piper sold almost 100 Malibus worth about $40 million. Welcome to ABC's Wide World of Flying. I'm Bill Cox, and we're here on Mojave Airport in California's high desert to investigate the mystique of the Malibu. Right up front, the airplane's primary attraction is simply that it's the fastest, most comfortable production single on the market. Cruise and climb are impressive, range is the best of any stock single, and this airplane can fly high above the weather. Part of the reason for the Malibu's success is that it's the first totally new airplane since the Ted Smith Aerostar designed to do one job only, fly high, fast, and comfortable. The Malibu design is pretty much an original. The wing has an unusually long 43-foot span, try fitting that into your T-hanger, and a short cord resulting in an 11 to 1 aspect ratio. This makes the Malibu almost ideal for high altitude flight and also produces a glide ratio of nearly 12 to 1. That means a Malibu at 21,000 feet AGL could glide power off 50 miles in any direction. Taking a lesson from Boeing, Piper's design team placed the tail as close as possible to the passenger cabin to reduce unnecessary weight, wetted area, and drag. Wing and fuselage skins are of thick 32 thousandths aluminum to minimize surface deformation at high speeds. The Malibu's engine is a 310 horsepower version of the Continental TSIO 520, designed specifically for the airplane. It's a variation on a geared 435 horsepower plant that's been derated to only 310 horsepower for reliability. And for that reason, the initial TBO was set by Continental at 2,000 hours. The engine utilizes dual turbochargers, one on the left and one on the right, and intercoolers to boost critical altitude to 20,000 feet and maximum 75% height to 25,000 feet. Everywhere you look, there's virtually nothing left hanging out to grab the wind. In short, this is an aerodynamically squeaky clean airplane. Perhaps the airplane's greatest asset, though, is its cabin-class comfort. The interior has dimensions similar to those of the Piper Navajo Twin. The environmental control systems keep everyone breathing warm, oxygen-rich air at any altitude. In short, the Malibu is about as close as you can come to a miniature six-place airliner. And that analogy certainly carries through to the front office. In many respects, the Malibu is as sophisticated as many airline jets, but without the complexity of extra engines. A typically equipped Malibu features backup systems for both vacuum and electrical power, de-icing, a flight director, navigation capability that often includes Loran C, 
glide slope and HSI, and storm scope. All features normally reserved for more expensive multi-engine piston and turbine aircraft. One of the Malibu's most impressive features is its pressurization system. With a maximum differential of 5.5 pounds, the Big Piper can maintain an 8,000-foot cabin at 25,000 feet. There's little reason not to fly high on virtually every flight. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Come along with us now as we take this Malibu up into its elements high above the Earth. At 4,100 pounds gross weight, the Malibu doesn't exactly scamper down the runway. The airplane has to catch its breath and accelerate to 110 knots before it begins to climb with the enthusiasm you might expect from a $440,000 machine. One of the great joys of pressurization is that you can dispense with oxygen masks. As you can see, we're now climbing through 13,000 feet at 1,200 feet per minute, but the cabin is only approaching 4,000 feet. The cabin rate of climb is barely 1,000 feet per minute. You might also notice that we're showing a fuel flow of just over 35 gallons per hour in climb. But climb is so quick in the Malibu, you're not at that high burn rate very long. Our altitude is above 15,000 feet now, and we've joined up with our camera ship, a Cessna Turbo 210. To emphasize the advantages of pressurization, take a look at the pilot and cameraman in our camera ship. For my money, there's never been a comfortable oxygen mask made, but that's one of the advantages of pressurization. Los Angeles Center, Malibu 9113 X-ray is level, flight level 250. Malibu 113 X-ray, uh, Roger. Well, right now we're about 25,000 feet above the sea, and off to our right, you can look down and see Mount Whitney, the tallest mountain in the 48 states. The cabin's pressurized to 8,000 feet up here at 25,000, so everyone's breathing comfortably. Also, as you can see, I've leaned the engine at 50 degrees on the lean side of peak, and we're burning uh, about 16 gallons an hour while we're cruising along at 216 knots. That makes this one of the most efficient airplanes around, despite the fact that it has 310 horsepower on front. Specific fuel consumption on the Malibu is uh, about 0.41 pounds per horsepower per hour. The reason for this is that you can lean the Malibu's engine to 50 degrees on the lean side of peak, and that's because the fuel distribution all cylinders is unusually even. That's the reason this airplane's capable of getting such uh, unusual economy, 16 gallons an hour with this much horsepower. With a full 122 gallons of fuel in the tanks and this much speed, we could probably uh, go all the way from here to Houston, Texas if we had full tanks. Pull back to 65%, we could even go on to uh, New Orleans. Because the Malibu's airfoils were designed specifically for high altitude operation, the airplane retains surprising control harmony. The ailerons remain quick and light, but not touchy. Elevator and rudder response are similarly friendly without the delayed reaction you often experience in models that have been adapted for tall altitudes rather than designed for them. The Malibu is equally docile in the pattern. Gear and flaps go down with minimum pitch change. Approaches work fine at any speed above about 80 knots and the airplane tries to make you look good rather than trying to embarrass you. Here's a pilot who's been looking good in the first production Malibu since 1984, Larry Grant. 
As I've flown to Malibu over these last three years, every number in a spec book has been coming up and maintaining those numbers. I still average 216 knots with a fuel burn of 16 gallons per hour at 25,000 feet. And I take that altitude many, many times. If the flight's over an hour, I fly to 25,000 feet. As the ultimate single engine airplane, the Malibu compares in both comfort and performance with many corporate twins. Yet, the Big Piper doesn't cost nearly as much to operate. Its redundant systems, weather topping turbocharger and pressurization, make it an eminently usable machine for regular high altitude trips, cruising in smooth air and sunshine above all the meteorological misery. Malibus aren't cheap. In fact, by the time you see this, Piper may have built its first half million dollar single engine airplane. The Malibu appeals to the buyer who could afford a corporate jet, but prefers to do his own flying. Maximum allowable speed in an airport traffic area is 142 knots, 156 knots, or 180 knots. The correct answer is 156 knots. Hi, I'm Barry Schiff, and this is the Big Bear City Airport, situated high in the mountains of Southern California. The airport elevation here is almost 7,000 feet above sea level, and when the summer temperature gets up to 90 degrees or more, the density altitude here can be well over 10,000 feet above sea level. A takeoff plan is essential. Every pilot knows that a situation like this calls for careful consultation with the pilot's operating handbook. The chart shows how to determine takeoff distance based on wind, aircraft gross weight, pressure altitude, and outside air temperature. Most handbooks specify using a short field procedure. This might include, for example, using a specific flap setting and using maximum available power prior to brake release. Most charts also show different liftoff speeds for when operating at less than maximum allowable gross weight. These charts are extremely valuable, but the big question is, how well do they relate to the airplane you fly and to your piloting techniques? Well, we've brought three airplanes up here today to compare book figures with some real-world performance. The first aircraft is a stiff-legged 1979 Cessna 172. It's got a 160-horsepower engine and a fixed-pitch propeller. We've got a 1967 Beechcraft V35B Bonanza, 285 horsepower, normally aspirated with a constant speed propeller. And finally, we have a 1981 Cessna Turbo 210. Its engine is rated for 310 horsepower for five minutes and 285 horsepower maximum continuous. It too has a constant speed propeller. Today, the reported wind, which is measured at the top of a tall building, is from 230 degrees at 15 knots. But the wind at ground level is only five knots. The temperature right now is 82 degrees, and the pressure altitude is 6,700 feet, which gives us a density altitude of 9,644 feet. Big Bear's runway is 5,850 feet long. It's fully paved, and it's level. So let's get started. We're using sandbags to bring the weight of each airplane right up to maximum allowable gross. For this Cessna 172, that's 2,400 pounds. You all right, Barry? Great, thanks a lot. Using the pilot's operating handbook, I've calculated that the required takeoff distance should be 1,815 feet. I'll be using a liftoff speed of 51 knots, as specified in the handbook for this gross weight. We've positioned an assistant with an orange flag at the calculated liftoff point, and we have another spotter with a white flag to help determine my actual liftoff point, <laughs> just in case more than the calculated distance is required.
The operating handbook calls for 10 degrees of flaps for a short field takeoff. After completing my checklist, I adjust the mixture at full throttle for maximum RPM. This provides maximum takeoff power. Good short field technique requires that you develop full power before brake release. Run the throttle in smoothly, double check the engine gauges, and release the brakes. This airplane is pretty anemic at this density altitude and weight. It's a lot different than my sea level takeoff from Santa Monica this morning, but I wait patiently for the airspeed to build. And I wait. And I wait. And finally, the airspeed reaches 51 knots, liftoff speed. As I'm coming back, I know I went past the orange flag. That was really no surprise. But just how much longer was my takeoff roll than the book predicted? That's the question we came to answer. Barry, your takeoff roll was about 2,200 feet. That's interesting. According to the book, the takeoff distance should have been 1,815 feet. But in reality, it was 2,200 feet long. That's an increase of about 22%. Let's take a look at a few of the possible reasons for this. This engine has quite a bit of time on it, so it probably doesn't deliver as much power as when it was new. There are several necks on the leading edge of the propeller, so it probably doesn't develop as much thrust as when it was new. There's some hangar rash on the leading edge of the wings. And who knows, this airplane probably has less than ideal rigging. Maybe the airspeed indicator is out of calibration, and my actual liftoff speed was higher than indicated. And perhaps my technique is less than the perfect polish of those test pilots who are trying to get the best performance possible for their factory marketing people. How did the Bonanza and the Turbo 210 do, you may be thinking? Well, I'll tell you. Never assume that flaps are always to be used for a short field takeoff, because according to the pilot's operating handbook, for this Bonanza, flaps are not to be used for a short field takeoff, so always follow the book. And when this airplane weighs 3,400 pounds, which is the maximum allowable gross weight, the recommended liftoff speed is 71 knots. I calculated that the takeoff roll for this Bonanza should be 2,250 feet. But in actual testing today, the best I could do was 2,750 feet. That's 500 feet longer than the book figure. And the Turbo 210 also failed to match book performance. With a maximum allowable gross weight of 4,000 pounds, the suggested liftoff speed is 72 knots. According to the chart, this airplane should be able to take off in 2,140 feet, but our best run was 2,400 feet. That's 260 feet longer than the book figure, or about 12% more. The lesson here should be a clear one. Don't count on book figures. Find out what your airplane really can do, and don't believe that if your performance is close to book at low density altitude, that you can automatically count on the same thing at high density altitude. Up here, little errors can add up to big differences in takeoff roll and initial climb rate. That's why we came here for this demonstration. And what about your takeoff technique in a high density altitude situation? Have you ever committed one of these common mistakes? 
Many pilots use the temperature given by ATIS or UNICOM in their takeoff calculations. Do you? The problem is, the reported temperature is measured in the shade. And performance charts specify that we use ambient temperature. That's the temperature right out here in the open, near the runway. On a hot, sunny day, ambient temperature can be 20 degrees or more than the reported temperature. And that 20 degree temperature difference has the effect of elevating the density altitude by 1,200 feet. And that can substantially increase the takeoff distance required. Another common problem is caused by low tire pressure. Underinflated tires have much higher rolling resistance and can add distance to your takeoff roll. Consider the runway. Does it slope uphill? Is it gravel, dirt, or grass? These factors can add significant distance to your takeoff roll. Are your flaps set correctly? Follow the advice in the pilot's operating handbook. Too much or too little flap extension can dramatically affect performance. Are you using all the runway? As the old saying goes, there's nothing as useless as the runway behind you. And are you holding the brakes until your engine is developing maximum power? You can be sure the test pilot at the factory did. And perhaps most critical, are you rotating precisely at the specified liftoff speed? Not too early and not too late? During a critical takeoff, it's difficult to resist pulling back on the yoke as you approach the end of the runway, but that can be a fatal mistake. Here's what happens. When the airplane is lifted off too soon, it just mushes along in ground effect. It may be so far behind the power curve that it is impossible to accelerate enough to climb. At best, the takeoff will be excruciatingly long. If you're facing a really difficult takeoff situation, why not lighten the load? At high density altitudes, just two or 300 pounds can reduce your takeoff roll by almost 1,000 feet. If necessary, make a couple of short hops to a lower elevation airport and then continue from there. Or why not spend the night? Join the dawn patrol and enjoy the benefit of the cold morning air. Oh, one final tip. Why not practice what the airlines do? After all your takeoff distance calculations are complete, add 20% or even more. Every airline takeoff includes a large safety margin. Why shouldn't you? Good takeoff technique is no accident. It's good practice, knowing your airplane and knowing how to fly it. Do you get full power on takeoff? Is your car heat really off when you think it is? Here's a quick way to check the rigging of your engine controls. Let's begin with the throttle control. When you push the knob all the way in, there should be a cushion of clearance at least a sixteenth of an inch or more between the knob and the instrument panel. The cushion of panel clearance means that the throttle at the other end of the cable is, in fact, hitting the full open stop in the carburetor or fuel injection system. The engine is capable of developing full power. If the throttle has no clearance when pushed all the way in, it indicates that the throttle cable is probably not adjusted properly. And the result is that the engine throttle cannot open fully. The throttle knob is hitting the instrument panel before the throttle plate can hit its full open stop. That cushion of throttle clearance is important to ensure that your engine is capable of developing full power for takeoff. Let me show you a few other controls you should check for a cushion of panel clearance. On airplanes equipped with a constant speed prop, check the propeller governor control or you may not be getting maximum RPMs on takeoff. Check the mixture control. If there's no cushion of panel clearance, you may not be getting a full rich mixture. On carbureted engines, check the carb heat control. If it has no panel clearance, the carb heat may never be fully off. 
If your engine has an alternate air door control, make sure it too has some panel clearance, or it may never fully close, which would let unfiltered air into your engine continuously. On twins, you'll be checking the clearance of the engine controls against the top of the pedestal instead of the panel, but the importance is the same. As a final quality test, always check your engine gauges immediately after applying full power on every takeoff roll. In an airplane with a fixed pitch prop such as this 172, you should be getting at least the minimum static RPM on the tachometer. In an airplane with a constant speed prop such as this Bonanza, you should see maximum RPM on the tack and the appropriate manifold pressure. These control rigging checks take only about 10 seconds, and usually the fix is just a cable adjustment by your mechanic. There was a feeling of unity in the air, and it's a time we don't have now, and it's a time that we haven't had. And I don't know if that time will ever return. She's just beautiful. If you know how to handle her, she'll do everything you want and more. I personally had my life saved by this aircraft due to the fact it, of the type of airplane it is. It's a beautiful airplane to fly. It's a graceful lady in the air. It's heavy on the controls and very sluggish, but you know, a woman doesn't like to be rushed. My fondest hope was to ride in this airplane one more time. I don't think there's ever been a B-17 pilot that doesn't have this desire. As soon as they started the engines, just, just hearing the props, the engines turning over, that came, a flood of memories came back with that. Okay, clear three. As soon as the airplane was in full, with all the engines going, like, I was back up in the cockpit, sitting there with my hand on the throttle, and doing all the procedures, running through the engines and everything, and it was just thrilling. When you're ready to go down that runway, my thoughts always were, what power? You pulled the throttles forward on that thing with all four engines going. There's nothing I would trade for that experience. No matter where I was going, that was the ultimate. There is a mystique that surrounds the B-17, a modern bomber during its time. It was commonly known as the Fortress. It was an aircraft of legendary reputation for taking care of those who flew her. Part of the fortress legend and mystique is its ability to sustain an almost unbelievable amount of battle damage and still continue to fly. The uh, construction was such that uh, it could take a great deal of damage. Uh, sections of the wing could be shot away, tail, uh, large holes in the fuselage, uh, just name it. Many times this airplane flew when it should not have flown. It's difficult to say how many air lives were saved, but it would be numerous uh, lives were saved because of uh, the airplane damage that it could take. Today, a restored B-17 can still stir emotions within the hearts of thousands of GIs. These are the men that still remember what this remarkable aircraft did. During the war years, nearly 13,000 B-17s of all models were built. Today, only a handful still fly. German and Japanese pilots soon learned the B-17 wasn't easy to bring down. Although thousands were shot down, rarely was it a simple affair. Not only could the fortress take a punch, it could deliver one too. From nose to tail, it was laden with bombs and 50 caliber machine guns. During the years of 1942 through 1945, the B-17 was used as America's primary weapon against Germany's industrial power. This was an aircraft that truly changed the course of history. But no longer does the fortress take to the sky with a load of bombs and a crew of 10 anxious men to face an onslaught of Messerschmitts and Falkwolf. Today, many thousands of miles and many thousands of days away from the darkness of World War II, this listening example 
of what American air power used to be takes to the peaceful skies. This B-17 was a uh, later model of the 17. It uh, was in the Pacific Theater of Operation, latter part of 44 and uh, 45. We got this airplane in 77 at the Arizona wing, and we restored it to what it is today. We take care of her just like, like a little baby. During pre-flight, the uh, control services all have to be checked, not only for movability, but for condition. Uh, the fabric's still on, or any cracks, uh, any tearing. So many people come around the airplane during the show that um, sometimes they can put a finger through the fabric and cause a hole to start. So we have to check it very carefully for movability and for condition. The main tanks uh, supply one tank for each engine, uh, except for the inboard engines and they have two tanks, but each one totals 425 gallons. Yeah, the Tokyo tanks in this aircraft are in the outer wing panels, and uh, they hold a conglomerate of each tank, which is actually five tanks in one, 270 gallons. So you can multiply four times 270 gallons, and that's the capacity of the Tokyo tanks. The, uh, the B-17 has a lot of famous firsts attached to it. Uh, for, one, for one thing, it was uh, built in one in a one-year period. It was, uh, Initial concept was in late 1934, and then August, July 28, 1935, the first B-17 flew. Among the first uh, uh, turbochargers, the first airplane to have a turbocharger. And the turbocharger operates very simply. It takes uh, exhaust air from the cylinders, pumps them through a little wheel, which causes the wheel to spin. It spins a turbine, which supplies pressurized air to the carburetor. The carburetor feeds a Curtis Wright 1820-97 nine-cylinder engine, which powers a Hamilton Standard constant speed propeller. These are the mixture controls controlling the uh, four Hamilton Standard constant speed propellers. They also have a control lock located to the right. The throttle lock is located here, a little bit unique in that forward locks all throttles, aft locks only the inborn throttles. The throttles, this is the unique how they move for each individually a, a very good design, as a matter of fact. Up here lie the mixture controls. They move from uh, war emergency through auto rich through auto lean to idle cutoff. The controls for the turbochargers located right here. Cow flap controls are closed, open, and locked and open. The ignition switches, along with the emergency gang bar that will shut off all four ends, located on the left. The entire airplane is is uh, overbuilt and with some redundancy. There's, as a, for instance, uh, the elevator controls, rudder controls are all double cabled in that uh, the rudders have two sets of cables running to them. Should one set be shot away, we would still have rudder control. Uh, each elevator has its individual cables. Should an elevator be shot away, we still have the other elevator uh, operating under its own control cable system. The trim tabs are the same way. The B-17 had an autopilot and an autopilot uh, that could also fly the airplane in formation. And this was done with a formation stick that's not at the moment in sentimental journey. But uh, the uh, elevators and ailerons are so heavy in the airplane that uh, it's very, very difficult to fly in formation. The uh, control pressures are so heavy and, and, and so ineffective with their 1935 design that uh, when we fly the airplane in air shows, we frequently run the control wheel to its full deflections just to get a, any rate of turn whatsoever. And this is at the higher speeds. The, uh, there is no maneuvering speed on the airplane and that uh, controls can be moved to their stops with no damage whatsoever to the airplane. Well, take off, roll, uh, tail will come up almost automatically if you give a little forward pressure on the wheel. Uh, when I hit 80 knots, that's when we start pulling back and lifting off. And we'll lift off anywhere between 80 and 90 knots we establish 110 knots as quickly as possible because that's uh, your minimum controllable airspeed with an engine or even two engines out. Um, unfortunately, on two engines, the airplane will not accelerate at all from that point. So if you're under 110 knots, you literally have to lower that nose to save the airplane, even though you don't want to, it's close to the ground. It's a mandatory situation.
uh, one engine, you can keep climbing at 110 knots and uh, probably gain about 500 feet a minute. These few remaining refurbished war horses are our legacy. Aircraft constructed of simple metal and fabric. But to the men who flew her, they will never forget her. Today, just their presence reminds us of another era, a journey back in time. And perhaps a sentimental journey at that. We always had this feeling that if you have to do it in any other airplane, do it in a B-17, because that is one that will always get you home. It's not only flying an airplane, it's flying history, and I think that's what gets me the most, sitting up there and taking what I call a cheap shot from my standpoint, because I haven't paid my dues, and I feel like about two inches high when I'm flying that thing because of all the other men that flew her and gave their lives and went through hell. You know, it's a, it's a different world. Did you know that in many airplanes, the fuel tank selector knob in the cockpit is quite a distance from the valve that actually controls fuel flow? For example, in the Cessna 421, the fuel control valves are out here in the wings, many feet away from the selector knob in the cockpit. Even in this 172, the tank control valve is a good foot away from the cockpit selector knob. So always feel for a detent when you switch tanks. It means the control valve is in a positive position. If you don't feel a detent, don't trust the selector knob. Just because the handle is pointing to the right tank doesn't mean that you're actually feeding from the right tank. The valve could be between tanks. In checking out in a new airplane, take a few minutes to learn the feel of the tank selector detents. Always select the tank to be used for takeoff before you start the engine. Clear? Don't switch tanks during taxi or run-up. Water or sediment might work through the system just as you're lifting off. Some pilots have had the fuel selector handle come off or break while switching tanks in flight. This is when an inexpensive pair of pliers can save the day. And finally, it's a good idea to plan on switching tanks when you're over another airport or suitable landing site. Every year, a number of pilots make forced landings due to tank switching problems, and you don't need to be one of them. The Lancer 235 is a kit-built airplane designed to realize the greatest possible speed from the least amount of horsepower. Normally, one horsepower per mile per hour is considered good efficiency among production airplanes. The Lance Air surpasses 200 miles per hour on just 118 horsepower. Hi, I'm Dave Jackson, pilot and one of the producers of ABC's Wide World of Flying. And this is the remarkable Lance Air 235. You know, even in home builds, the Lance Air is considered an unusual machine. Not only because of its speed, efficiency, and its obvious good looks, but because it just may be the first of a new generation of truly easy to assemble composite home builds. We're here at Santa Paula, California, home of Lance Nybauer, the designer of the Lance Air. And perhaps it's appropriate that Nybauer's company, Nyco Aviation, should be based here, since Santa Paula is a popular haven for both classic and home built airplanes in Southern California. Nybauer's Lance Air has become a tremendous success. And only a year and a half, Nyco Aviation has sold over 200 kits, making the Lancer design the most popular since the Kristen Eagle. Lance, I understand you didn't start out to be a home-built designer. How'd you get started designing airplanes? Uh, no, I didn't. My background is that of an artist and a designer. Uh, I like to think the, uh, the artistry shows a little bit in the Lancer. Uh, the aerodynamics has been a thing I've been studying on my own for uh, quite a few years now. I do have a background, a family background in aviation that's, uh, my uncle was uh, involved with Al Myers and they brought the uh, Myers 200. Uh, it became reality through their work and effort. 
Uh, my dad was involved with Stinson, and uh, so I grew up around airplanes, but not directly involved in it. But um, I had a love for flying ever since that first ride in the Myers 200 that really set the hook. I looked at production airplanes when I was ready to buy something. Uh, that's probably what set the, uh, the seeds in motion here, but uh, I couldn't find anything in the production line that I was comfortable with, either for performance versus speed, primarily, versus cost. Uh, so I turned right away to something that was at that time new to me, and that was the home-built movement. The number one was performance on minimal horsepower. I wanted to, uh, to go fast with as little power as would do it. The, uh, the other thing was cockpit comfort. I wanted to get a lot of comfort out of the cockpit and yet keep the wetted area of the airframe down. And that's a difficult thing to do usually, and that's where I saw I had a lot of advantages, particularly with composites. Composites, I think, are the future because they don't rot, they don't rust, they don't corrode, they don't fatigue. The only thing they're susceptible to is temperature. And composites to this date have used all room temperature systems, and that has some inherent problems on a hot day in Mojave, for example. Uh, Skin temperatures uh, can get up to the point where you reach a, the T sub G of the material, which is a glass transition temperature. The uh, high temperature materials in all of ours are done in ovens under pressure, 250 degree cure cycles. They're stable to 250 degrees, and it makes a, a big, big difference in the longevity of the part. Uh, we did go to the Lycoming 0235, uh, typically 118 horse. With that, over the Continental 100 horse, we see uh, about 15 miles an hour more and perhaps uh, 300 feet per minute climb increase. Uh, the 235 will top out at 225, uh, cruises at 210, and uh, we've demonstrated that in several races, and uh, I think the skeptics are believers now. <laughs> One of the differences between this and some other home builds is that the Lance Air has the same horizontal cabin dimension as a Bonanza. Though it's definitely a snug little airplane that you put on rather than climb into, the cockpit is fairly comfortable. Nybauer limited seat recline to 22 degrees rather than the 40 to 45 degrees used in some other composite home builds. So the seat backs in a Lance Air feel more like a sports car's than a home builds. The panel on the Lance Air 235 is equally sporty and compact, but it's not cramped. I'm sure you'll notice that on the left side, Lance has installed two simulated gyros for demonstration purposes only. As you can see, I chose control sticks versus uh, control wheels. I think that's because anybody that flies a, a stick plane versus a wheel plane is, will agree it's more natural feeling uh, holding a stick for something that's moving three dimensions rather than a wheel. With only 118 horsepower out front, the Lance Air doesn't exactly burn up the asphalt, but stall speed is a fairly low 55 miles per hour, so the airplane doesn't need a lot of runway. Once we got the Lance Air airborne, cleaned up, and accelerated to best rate of climb speed of 124 miles per hour, the VSI settled on about 1,250 feet per minute. The landing gear is electric hydraulic, that's for simplicity. Flip a switch and the gear goes up in six and a half seconds. Open a dump valve and the gear comes down and locks automatically. The flaps are electric, again that's simplicity. I also incorporated a 10 degree flap reflex trailing edge up for improved cruise performance. Control response is sensitive yet stable. Uh, that's the best way to put it, probably. The plane will fly hands off very well, yet it's not a heavy-fisted airplane. It's a three-finger airplane. You fly with uh, two fingers and, and uh, a thumb, and then you think your turns, and you've done them. Yet if you let go of the stick, it'll trim out and fly hands off very nicely. The plane is set up now for what I would consider relatively deluxe VFR flying. We get asked uh, often whether or not it can be uh, outfitted for IFR, and yes, it can, very easy to do. Speed wasn't my only goal in Lance Air, but it was one of the major ones. I wanted an airplane that would be efficient in all respects, not just cruise. And with the L235 engine, I can see 210 miles per hour uh, every day on, as a cruise, and yet we're doing it on about six and a half gallons per hour, and I think that's uh, real good efficiency. In automotive terms, that's about 30 miles per gallon. 
Maneuverability is another area where the Lance Air shines. Roll rate is over 115 degrees per second, so a full aileron roll requires only about three seconds. Elevator response is also super quick, almost too quick in fact. At cruise speed, the elevator is so light it seems to move practically by thigh. 60 degree banks are a mere flick of the wrist away. In short, flying this airplane is a ball. It was a very stable airplane. It trimmed beautifully. But at the same time, with its rapid roll rate and its ability to turn quickly, uh, it's a, a fun airplane to fly. And it's just uh, a real thrill to fly in the thing, the way it handles and try to fly smooth and everything about it. Just, just like it. You want to land on other than big runways and landing in small airports, uh, sometimes you can't do it with a high performance aircraft. This one, you could get into big ones and small ones and get there in a hurry. If control response is exciting, stalls are anything but. Gear and flap extension produce very little pitch change, and the airplane feels very stable as speed is reduced. The Lance Air doesn't do much at the brake, except pitch down, straight ahead. Recovery is simply a matter of releasing back pressure and letting the airplane fly itself out of the stall. In the pattern, the Lance Air behaves like a miniature Mooney, but with far better control response. The NLF airfoil retains plenty of lift for flare and generally has no surprises for any pilot checked out in a high-performance retractable. Despite the airplane's slippery looks, it's a docile machine around the patch. Lance, that's about as much fun as I've ever had in an airplane. I can see why they're so popular. Yeah, I think the home-built movement has offered some truly spectacular flying. Our builder's program, in which the uh, customer can come in and work in our shop, has also been a great benefit for them because they get expert guidance from us. I'm over here perhaps once a week, which is a, bit, a big advantage. And, uh, you know, they, anything we wanted has been supplied, either information or materials. One of the great things about the kit itself has been the support from the factory. And by that I mean that when we've needed a component or we've needed additional instructions, we can call down here one day and virtually receive whatever we need, UPS, the next day. Composite construction is the easiest construction you could do in my terms. And it's so easy that uh, you could teach somebody in a half hour and they could build the whole airplane and virtually build it with a paintbrush. It's, since composite is glue, Everything is glued together. We've had a few minor problems with maybe the manual not being as complete or as well diagrammed as we could have used. This is the first aircraft I've ever tried to build. Um, the manual has since been rewritten and improved. Uh, the pre-molded parts, though, have been an absolute joy to work with. They align the way they're supposed to. They're easy to work with, easy to shape. Oh, I'm perhaps 30%, optimistically 30%, into the thing now. The gear is in, the hydraulics are not fitted, but they're all in position. Um, the problems have mostly, mostly been uh, getting used to working with fiberglass. I bought the first plane and Lance, had, uh, oh, the first one to the public, Lance was building the very first one, and I got parts shortly thereafter before he started drawing plans or writing a book or anything else. So I'd go over there in the evenings and crawl underneath his airplane or all over it, take measurements, draw little sketches and diagrams, and he'd give me some of his notes, and uh, I'd go home and work my airplane. A Lancer 235 kit costs just slightly under $16,000. Add another $10,000 for engine prop and avionics, and you'll spend just about $26,000 for a completed airplane. The kit does, however, include a pretty complete package of materials and prefabricated components. Remember, though, you still have to build the airplane. NICO says construction time should take about a thousand hours if you're doing everything right. In simpler terms, this means if you work 10 hours a week, you'd spend about 100 weeks building a Lance Air. In contrast, for about the same amount of money, you could buy an older Mooney, a Comanche, or a Cardinal RG. You wouldn't get anywhere near the performance of a Lance Air 235, but on the other hand, you could fly one of these away the same day you handed over the cashier's check.
But that's not what home builds are really all about. A man who builds his own airplane may very well be looking for economy, but he's also the kind of pilot who enjoys the satisfaction of knowing that he built the plane himself. And if the plane is a Lancer, the ultimate fun is in flying it.